I cannot believe it. We are about to launch into the Halix reunion. Reunited and it feels so good. Roll call. Hey everyone. My name is Matthew Serrano and I'm the director of Live from the Space Stage, A Halix Story. The documentary that you just saw and depending on how you liked it, either I'm sorry or you're welcome. And I'm Jeanette Klinger Hurley and I was one of the Warrior Bay Backup Girls. Woohoo! I'm Roger Freeland and I was the Baharna, or as you would know me, the Wookiee. Hi, I'm Felice Bosnott Leeds, and I am the makeup artist who was lucky enough to create the masks for Halix. Hi, I'm Tony Coppola. I was the amphibious percussionist with Halix, known to the world as the WOG. Hi, everybody. I'm Jeannie Cunningham, and I wrote the most unlikely song ever performed in any theme park in all of history. It was called JLB. <gasps> and I am Richard Kraft, the host for this incredible reunion. I'm a hardcore Disneyland nut job. This is a 1970s parking lot tram operator shirt. And we are about to launch into the ultimate reunion of the world of Felix. So Matthew. Yes. When did Halix show up on your radar? Halix showed up on my radar when I got a call from Kevin Perger at Defunctland saying, hey, uh, we should team up and make some. At the time, we thought, oh, let's make like a 40 minute video for his YouTube channel. We had no idea we were going to make a feature film, let alone my first feature film. We went through tons of different ideas, all of them trying to stay in the realm of, well, like what's something that was a thing and is now defunct? And he goes, go on Google right now and type in Halix. And I was like, okay, how do you spell that? So I type it in, I look at it, and immediately you see just like a couple of the images. You see the poster that's behind you right now. And there were like two blog posts and that was it. And that was my first exposure to Halix. So Halix ends and before the documentary, there's a almost 40 year period. Was it completely, you were in it, then it was over, and then there was a documentary or is there anything about Halix in the middle period? Not for me, it, exactly as you said, Richard, the project ended. Uh, I, went, I resumed my dance career and I, I just went on from there. And I didn't even really think about it too much. Occasionally I would come across the Halix shirt when I was moving or something. And then the next thing was when Matt called. You just mentioned a Halix shirt. What, can we see your Halix shirt? Yeah, oh, where is that thing? <laughs> Here you go. <laughs> okay, I do remember uh, having that. Yes. Uh, Someone took and, it. And by the way, guys, I'll have you know it still fits. Nice. That's yeah, the look most the impressive. Same to me. You look adorable, the same as you always do. I know. Do. Nice. <laughs> Roger, what was your life right before Halix, and what are you up to now? Brian and I were in a band together. Afterwards, and I did a nice run as uh, as a session singer. My favorite credit that you that you told me was you were part of a certain theme song, an animated show theme song, legendary. Oh, oh, that's right, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. What? 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 Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, voices in the theme song. Yeah. Uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. That was you. Half show. Yeah, we did the theme for that. Oh my gosh, it's both historically important and residual-wise important. <laughs> so I want to segue to a very important guest, and one word sort of sums it up, Jailbait. Can we welcome the writer of the song, Jailbait, Jeannie? <laughs> so I have one question for you to start with. What the hell were you thinking? <laughs> yeah, right. Isn't All right. Up? So at the time, here I am, I was uh, 22, 23. Um, at that time, I really kind of was anarchistic in my thoughts, just only in my thoughts. My behavior was still rather ladylike. So I decided to turn this thing on its heels. I said, you know, okay, you never hear about a woman being older than a, a guy. So let's just turn it on its ear and just write a song called Jailbait. The next thing I know, I get called into Disney because Halix was looking for songs and I've you know, been a songwriter for quite a while. So I said, sure, I'll, you know, I gave him the, 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 the songs off of this demo. 
And I forgot Jailbait was on there. I thought for sure they were gonna use another song. And then they said, we're using Jailbait. And I was like, baby, I want you, but you Jailbait. <laughs> <laughs> so Felice, uh, Pri I hear your journey started in the mail room of Disney. How do you go from the mail room to making an amphibious face? You know, kind of long story short, it was the way it was at the studio at that time. And it was an open door policy. And if you were working in the mail room, people knew if you had ambitions to do something beyond that, and they were willing to help you. And so somebody in the music department tapped me about these masks that were going to be made. And if I wanted to give it a shot, I would do that. So I went home and I, I literally sculpted the amphibian mask on, on a mold of my own face and brought it back to work on Monday. And they liked it and said, go for it. And if I could make that one, then I could go and do the other three. And the masks you made were amphibian and and then um, the big Wookiee. We used to call you the Barhemoth, though. Do you remember that? Yes. Bob Schiffer and I <laughs> called. We had our name for you. Yeah. Yes. Barhemoth or something. Bar Bar Barhemoth is what we would call it. Yeah. Right. Did you ever get lost in that mask? Where you did you? I mean, the way you were rolling around on the stage. I honestly, when I saw the video footage of that, I mean, it was hard to remember and then to see you rolling around. Did that ever feel like it was going to fall off or did you kind of lose it while no. it was on? No, really? I don't remember that ever happening. It was it was really functional. How the heck did you go to the back? You did the behemoth, barhemoth, and you did the amphibian, and right. you also did... The keyboard player. What was the, the keyboard player mask made out of? That was made out of a very light resin. And then a lot of the pieces, I, I literally went to the hardware store and found light pieces of plumbing or hardware that I attached to the side of the helmet to look like what the drawing was and, and paint. Matthew. Yes. Where in the world did you find that remarkable footage of the band performing? This is like the Zabruder film of Disneyland. <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually have Mr. Roger Freeland to thank. After I finished interviewing with him, I showed him Facebook and I said, which of these old white guys named Brian Lucas is the, is the drummer from Halix? So I asked, I asked Roger who it was. He, he said, it's that one and you got it right. I messaged Brian. In, in this message, he said, ah, I remember Halix. I was just looking at the footage the other day and I remember my brain exploding and me typing, wait, what? <laughs> he told me that it was his, I believe, eight-year-old little brother at the time who came Don't to they? watch them, yeah. watch you guys perform. And he brought a high eight camera and shot two of your guys' performances. Wonderfully filmed, by the way, might I add, because he got coverage. He held a, he, he had a steady hand, kept everything in focus. And uh, yeah, he's held on to that tape for the last 39 years. Let's actually take a moment to tell us about Laura. What was she like? And what do you think about when you think about her? You know, I felt um, like a sister to her, you know, like she was one of my big sisters and I have, you know, some powerful singers in my family as well and I had, actually lost my sister when I was 13. And she reminded me a lot of my older sister, Peggy, that passed away. She had a huge voice and just this power that you walk in the room and everyone goes, whoa, you know? And so Laura had that, you know, really, I, I admired her greatly. When it did end, as I said, I went back and resumed a dance career and all that stuff. But I think at the back of my mind, I absolutely assumed that something would happen for Laura. I, I love playing behind that voice and, and working with all of you, you know, good musicians, good singers, good stuff. The, the, uh, and for me, it was great. I had had a gymnastics career, I had a degree in music, and it was a logical combination doing this kind of stuff. I got to be visual and still use my percussion and stuff. But I absolutely assumed that something was going to happen for Laura. Roger, what's your memories of Laura? As Jeanette said, it, she was easy to hang with in the band. You know, she was comfortable with what she was doing. 
we were all comfortable with each other. Uh, everybody was a pro and it was just a lot of fun, you know, and she, and yeah, she was not a diva. She was a very talented singer. And it was a very kinetic show, you know, I mean, what Tony was doing, what Laura and Bruce were doing, there was a lot of motion, a lot of visual excitement to the show, which I think is a, a lot of what the appeal was for the kids. Matthew, I have two questions for you. Okay. What asset do you wish you could have found film or photo or recording what it was the holy halix grail the commercial i the commercial has to exist somewhere it yeah. plays all wow. summer long i remember seeing it on tv do you remember that felice were you involved no in that? i didn't even know there was a commercial okay because multiple people have confirmed that they saw the commercial on tv and that you guys remember the filming of it i've heard multiple stories like Bruce told me that he had to jump on a trampoline to get a shot of him with the guitar, like in midair. Tom, Tom said that he took your mask, they took your mask release and they set it on the edge of the stage and they shot lasers through the eyes. What was it like for you emotionally watching the documentary? Let's start with uh, Jeannie. It was wonderful. It was great. I mean, I was just really proud to watch it, proud to be a part of it. And I was sad that I didn't have, I had never gotten a chance to talk with each of the band members because my first impression when I saw them in, in concert was, these guys are serious players. They're really freaking fantastic players. I wanted to, to, to you know, get a chance to, at least the film gave that opportunity. We're pretty used to, as as musicians and artists, we're used to doing things and they don't work out and you just move on, you know? It's it's just part of how, how it is. The thing that was really a pleasure was to remember, because my memory of it was that the band was really good. When I watched the footage, that really confirmed it. It was really, it was really well done. And, and, you know, we were all, you know, in our prime. It was, it was really a lot of fun. Tony? What were your emotions when you were watching the documentary? The part about Laura, it, it definitely was emotional. I felt very sad that her career didn't blossom as it should. And I also found myself, Richard, thinking this because the project ended and I went back and I resumed a dance career. And I found myself wondering, well, if the project had gone on and I'd stayed with it, <laughs> would I or would I not have had this dance career as well? So exactly. you wonder if certain things are meant to be, and I can think that for myself, but I don't want to think that for Laura. I think what was meant to be were better things for her. But seeing that band perform again, and the way that they looked on the stage also filled me with so much pride. I was just, I felt really, really proud of that, that time in my life. and. Just so grateful, Matthew, that you were able to find the footage and put this story together because, like you said, Roger, I think we were all were in our prime at that time. And I know for me, I had never done anything like this before. So I've always looked back at that project and thought, you know, I, I did something that I didn't think I could do and it was successful. And I'd always carried that with me in everything else I did. I was always able to just feel like I can do that because I did Halix. So I always knew that that was, that I could go out of my box and be successful. For me, Halix is also about all those people we believe in and have hopes and dreams on their behalf. And we mm -hmm. suffer some of our heartbreaks when things don't pan out the way we think they will. And when you think something is completely forgotten, you never know how the ripples are going to affect other people. It is had a huge impact on me, especially during a very dark time. The weird optimism and absolute goofiness has been a blessing to be in my life. The last thing we're going to do is, do you all know how to do the Halix hand sign? All right, so the easiest, smoothest way to do it is, so everyone take your hands like this, and then you take your thumbs and your pinkies. You bring them together, and then bring it in. Boom. Oh. On the count of three, say hail, hail. One, two, three. Hail, 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 hail,
Hey guys, gotta go. Got another Zoom with some Halix fans. It's been great, thanks, bye. Bye. Later. Later. Later.